All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to day four of Children's Week. I'm glad you're able to join us for this afternoon session. My name is Caroline O'Corey. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and sleep medicine specialist here at Stanford Children's Health. A few housekeeping notes. First, this uh, session, uh, this session awards both CME and ANCC credits. You'll receive an email tomorrow from the Stanford CME office with instructions on how to obtain those credits if you're interested. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to send questions to our speaker. Uh, we, we look forward to your questions, your cases, and try to make this um, as engaging as, as possible. Uh, this afternoon session is on pediatric urgencies and emergencies. We are so pleased to have Dr. Sherelle Smith with us for this session. So Dr. Smith is an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine and in Pediatrics. She's currently the assistant medical director of the Stanford Pediatric Emergency Department. And she completed her medical education at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, and both her pediatric residency and pediatric emergency medicine fellowships at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Dr. Smith focuses her current efforts in clinical operations, as well as process improvement with a focus on health equity. She also spends her time engaging community, uh, with community pediatricians and providers and with pediatric acute care education via her outreach initiatives. And her clinical interests include injury prevention, asthma, and pediatric resuscitation. Dr. Smith, we are so happy to have you and I will turn this over to you. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, can you guys see an objective slide? Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Corey, for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. I am your lunchtime entertainment. So let's go ahead and dive into some pediatric emergency uh, medicine. I'm so excited to have all of you join and thank you to everyone who submitted questions or cases um, prior to our webinar today. So those topics have been incorporated into today's presentation in our cases. And if there's any additional time, I'll try to answer some questions from our chat with the help of course with Dr. Akori. So we'll go ahead and get started, okay? So this was a huge topic to tackle in the allotted time provided. So I felt I would use the pandemic or so to guide what we address today. So we'll review ED visits pre and post COVID and use what we uncover here to address the emergencies that we still see the most frequently in the pediatric ED during these pandemic times. So spoiler alert, these were kind of the uh, diagnoses that we were continuing to see uh, throughout the pandemic. <clears throat> and I'm getting over cold. So if you see me pause to drink some water or I go into a coughing fit, I, I promise I will recover and I will be okay. <laughs> So guys, eight years ago, there were about 5,000 pediatric or that 5,000 emergency departments, I should say, in the U.S. And of those emergency department visits, uh, 141 million visits were children who were younger than the age of 15. 28 million of those visits were children who have unique medical needs that are different from those of adults. So just kind of like one fact that I really wanted to put out there and kind of like what we see in the emergency department is just even where these kids are presenting. So even though we have freestanding emergency departments and emergency departments associated with many different types of hospitals, all of them are not pediatric specific emergency departments. 80% of those millions of visits that I just talked to you guys about were actually at general emergency departments. Okay, so this figure represents pediatric ED visits during the pandemic. So after the pandemic was declared in March, um, this figure represents what the population did at least stratified by age over the last couple of years. Before 2014, ED visits were rising about 1% or so a year. And then in the post-ACA period or the post-Affordable Care Act period, they were seeing almost a 10% increase in ED visits and within a year's time span. However, as you guys can see here, this is denoted by the yellowish gold uh, visits in the fine dotted line and more of the continued yellowish dotted lines. Those represent the pediatric population up until age 17. 18 or so starts to be that kind of teal colored line there. But what I wanted to do here was to show you the significant decrease in volume of patients that we saw during the pandemic. So 
<clears throat> these declines were in all types of EDs. It, did, it wasn't affected by geographic location. We saw this decline on the West Coast. It was seen in the Southeast, the Midwest, and then especially across the board, diagnoses, especially in communicable diseases, also declined. However, unfortunately, serious conditions that may have represented families avoiding care during the pandemic also occurred. There was some thought that maybe some of these uh, visits, especially the decline in injuries, may have been due to like social distancing that was occurring, or if uh, people weren't traveling as much, there weren't as many activities going on as usual, and that could have been a reason too why we decide we saw the decline in pediatric visits specifically. Okay, so this figure is characterized as the decrease by diagnosis or by age still. And as you can see across the board, all ages decline. So again, 18 is kind of like that gold color. And we have a greenish color here. And our youngest patients, those less than 10, also took a sharp decline during the pandemic. Now, this one categorizes by diagnoses. So in the blue line, we still saw a, a continued of serious pediatric conditions, which we'll dive into in a second, but those still presented. However, other respiratory infections, superficial injuries, those things significantly decline after the start of the pandemic. And this is just a table representing from a study that was done on urgent care visits and emergency department visits during the pandemic that show kind of the most common diagnoses that were still seen in the um, in urgent care settings and in, and in uh, the emergency department. So as you can see, especially those low acuity visits, there were upper respiratory infections, otitis media, and fever. But I'm pretty sure that you guys didn't come here today to hear about how to manage viral illnesses and otitis media. And then I also just wanted to show for my folks here from Stanford, this is what our uh, kind of like low acuity visits look like right at that pre-pandemic stage that started to increase. We were seeing fevers, ear pain, cough, rashes, very similar to the rest of the nation and what we were seeing. Okay, and then this also represents those most common visit diagnoses that were occurring in the pandemic, and then also the rate of decline that we saw during that time period. So as you can see, like superficial injuries decreased by 56%, rather as things that were related to upper respiratory infections like bronchiolitis, we had a whole hiatus, right, of RSV decreased by a significant amount, 73%, our asthma visits, negative 76% and flu, a tremendous hit. And again, comparing just to what the volumes look like here and the diagnosis that we saw here at Stanford during the pandemic for those low acuity visits included falls, swab only, and still upper respiratory infections and ear pain. So this was pulled from an international study that was um, that looked at again by, uh, visits that occurred during the pandemic, and they saw similar a decrease in injuries, a decrease in infectious diseases, but they still saw significant presentations of mental health disorder, self harm or suicide attempts, or violence and assault. So I do want to spend a little bit of time today talking a little bit on closed head injuries, and that's why you saw that as a part of our objectives that were listed today. So, you know, even internationally, we saw changes in pediatric emergency medicine, but returning to the US, still the most common emergent diagnosis that was seen in the pandemic besides injuries were fever. And then we also still saw surgical emergencies of appendicitis and actually intussusception. Hence the reason why we'll focus on those emergencies first today, and then we'll continue to move forward with getting through some of those urgencies work through some cases, and then hopefully be able to take some questions for you all. So I figured the first thing we could talk about because fever was still such a very prominent feature of the diagnoses that we were still seeing in the pandemic um, was, uh, was fever. And the first thing that I ask myself whenever I see a patient, and I must address it very quickly, is asking myself, is this patient sick? Are they not sick? Is this actually an uncomplicated viral illness or are you septic? A big question to try to answer in the first you know, interaction with a family, but I still think it is the most important. <clears throat> 
So pediatric patients have lower mortality rates associated with sepsis when they present to pediatric ED and pediatric hospital admissions. But why is this? And this is usually because places like this, like pediatric EDs and children's hospitals have pediatric specific protocols. They have continuing medical education and pediatric specific clinical competencies that push them to be able to recognize things like sepsis sooner. We also have PIM trained providers, pediatric quality improvement initiative associated with these visits. And we have an evidence proven readiness when it comes for urgent and emergent visits. So I know I have a mixed audience here, so we'll keep things kind of on the recognition size of sepsis, but there are several things that I really want to highlight when you're looking at that patient coming in with fever and you're worried that they could be a little bit sicker than what you're able to handle even in your clinic or in your urgent care. So the big things that I want to make sure that we talk about is that children at the highest risk of bacteremia are under age two. And we suspect that this is the case. They're not fully immunized by age, well, they'll be fully immunized by age two, but this is a big risk of the, the patients who are presenting and that infant age is that they haven't gotten those vaccinations yet. And I think a big thing to recognize in our providers or have our providers recognize is that tachycardia and hypothermia really needs to be recognized up front and kind of prompt that red flag that you guys are like, okay, we need to do something more for this patient. And at big tertiary care centers, those high risk patients for sepsis should kind of be at that front and center of your triage nurses protocols of, hey, this isn't just a viral illness fever. These children are gonna need a little bit more prompt attention. And those children would include those who have indwelling CBCs or indwelling catheters, those who have the potential for being neutropenic. So our patients who are currently under chemotherapy regimens or immunocompromised for other reasons. And if they have short gut kids, those are also kids that should be high on your list of suspicion for sepsis. So for your reference, I just wanted to make sure because those of you who also maybe practice in the adult world and also care for pediatric patients, that you have something to be able to review for general vital signs and guidelines. You all know that these vary by age for us. So we just wanted to make sure that we included that. But I think for the biggest thing to remember as a rule of thumb for neonates, for those who are less than 28 days of old, and then this is specifically addressing uh, systolic blood pressures. If it's less than 60, that could be like a normal age range for that, for that group. Infants from a one month to 12 months of age, systolics around 70 for children a year to 10. That's when you can use our kind of back pocket formula of a systolic blood pressure of 70 plus two times the year in age should be around about where you're aiming for systolic blood pressures. And then children over 10, you can follow the charts of the usual blood pressures. But things you wanna also remember putting my pediatrician hat on is that this is also can be stratified by uh, weight and height. So we use this a lot with our growth charts and seeing those kids, if they're approaching that 99th percentile or 95th percentile, that those may vary based on the actual size of the patient. Okay, so this figure, you guys, is from a meta-analysis pulling from the most common causes of pediatric occult bacteremia in the post-pneumococcal conjugate vaccine area. So as you guys know, strep pneumonia, E. coli, strep, uh, group B strep, and staph they're the major players and remain the major players of the uh, causes of what we think would, would show a kid in sepsis versus like a viral cause. But I also want to make sure that I mention when we get into septic neonates that you're also considering acyclovir for AH, HSV coverage. And one of the big thing I wanted to make sure I mentioned too, given our mixed audience, I know the resources and supplies that are at our pediatric critical care and at my other pediatric emergency medicine colleagues to manage sepsis, those things aren't at your fingertips. However, I do want to review the surviving sepsis campaign to put emphasis on the rapid recognition of sick patients is so beneficial when it comes to the outcomes of these patients. And there are important steps to recognize even as soon as within an hour of recognizing shock as well as the first three hours of recognizing that a child could be in sepsis that we'll go through here in a little bit. 
So this is a nice uh, schematic that's available on the 2020 Surviving Sepsis Campaign site that you guys can refer to. But I just wanted to highlight that it's just super important to try to initiate obtaining apps to access labs and especially lactate and initiating fluids. That's a really appropriate part. If fluids, if they are appropriate, sorry, that's a really important start of managing and recognizing sepsis and shock. The stabilization or improvement that you can obtain in the ED or even in an urgent care setting, it is possible, but the patient can easily decompensate. So the required titration of interventions and even throughout the admission process is something that we have to really make sure that we keep a close eye on. And why I just wanna highlight that continuous reassessment of any child that you feel may be septic or approaching shock presentations is extremely important. I also wanna highlight the use of hydrocortisone if you're concerned for refractory shock, especially those with like electrolyte derangements, because when we know that there, a child has like an adrenal insufficiency we automatically know that we're going to provide stress dosing. However, if you notice that the child still isn't improving, that there is a significant electrolyte derangement, specifically with sodium and potassium, you should also consider moving hydrocort uh, giving hydrocortisone as a part of those first adjuncts that you're going to do. And it's for me, it's like one of the things that I think about if you're not re responding to fluids or if I'm considering starting pressors, that's usually my next thought process of, okay, maybe I should also consider steroids in this patient. So again, further management, the things I just wanna make sure that we drive home is that the prompt initiation of empiric antibiotics is important. And per the figure that we showed earlier, those are kind of the most common causes of occult bacteremia things to remember. I just also wanna prompt you guys to remember to review your area's resistance patterns. So like being trained on the, in the Southeast and coming to the West Coast, I noticed there was a big difference with the susceptibility of MRSA related to Clinda from where I trained before. So maybe when I'm treating that, I consider Bactrim more so than Clinda. So just being aware of your area's resistance patterns is also really important with our antibiotic stewardship and the selection of antibiotics. The other thing I want to make sure that we mention is that you should also remember pseudomonal coverage, um, though especially those children that would be presented in a neutropenic state. Ceftriaxone alone is going to cut it. Even if you've already given that dose of ceftriaxone, you can again, again to provide a dose of cefepine to cover for pseudomonas. Um, and then also too, if you have a child that's super ill appearing, they're not getting any better, go ahead and broaden in those antibiotics. Maybe you should go ahead and include vancomycin um, instead of just ceftriaxone alone in a child who's pretty ill appearing. Then I feel like we, we can't talk about sepsis and not dwell a little bit more into shock. We mentioned it some with the surviving sepsis campaign. However, again, with the focus here on recognition, I just wanna highlight a couple of clinical pearls that I think have helped me out and I hope they'll help you do the same. And I think that acting on sustained tachycardia, the proper assessment of a patient's perfusion and mental status are really important. Persistent tachycardia may not be related to that crying baby or that fussy baby, but rather the patient is in compensated shock. If the patient continues to have poor perfusion or you just never saw that toddler or that you know 12 month old alert and smiling during your visit, even if you've had them for OBS in the ED a little while, you've given them fluid and they still look tired and puny and the, even the mom is really concerned like, hey, my child is just way more sleepier than usual. These can be useful triggers in recognizing that this patient needs more support than what I can offer. And that could be this child being seen in a sick visiting clinic. It could be you evaluating them and obtaining this assessment in urgent care and realizing that's going to need transport from urgent care to the pediatric ED. Or even if you're in the pediatric ED and you're seeing this patient and you've started resuscitation, but you still have sustained tachycardia and there's a question about perfusion, Maybe that's going to thwart your floor admission, and this is going to either, I'm going to do more continued resuscitation in the ED, or now have I changed my this patient's management plan, are they going to require ICU level of care? So again, early recognition is key. <laughs>
And then the last point I want to make sure that I uh, talk about, especially since fever is still a really common presentation in urgent settings for acute care, as well as in the pediatric emergency department visits, is that, you know, did you consider Miss C in this time? Uh, there are many pathways that have been established and those of you visiting from other institutions, your institution may also have a Miss C pathway. I've, I've pictured here our um, children, Stanford's children's or LPCH's Miss C inflammatory pathway that we go ahead and start thinking about when we see patients in the ED. But one thing that I've noticed across the board for different Miss C pathways, if inclusion criteria are met, it, no one's going to fault you for going ahead and starting that lab evaluation in the ED setting. And if your pathway only includes laboratory studies, I will also strongly recommend obtaining an EKG. We did see many cases of myocarditis either associated with the vaccine or with the illness itself. So I will always want to make sure if I'm considering Miss C that I'm also thinking about cardiac function and I want to make sure that I get an EKG along with that. One thing that I felt like was established over multiple pathways is uh, even if it was from, if you're using our Stanford Children's Health Pathway, or if you're using CHOPS or Seattle Children's, is that there was always a mention of a child having a fever longer than a couple of days, or if the child was ill appearing, they would fall into this pathway along with other inclusion criteria. Okay, so. A potential GI source of sepsis-like presentations are appendicitis. So I'll use that to segue into this surgical emergency that still appeared during the pandemic in pediatric emergency departments nationwide. So appendicitis requires prompt evaluation by our friends in pediatric surgery. There were over 80,000 children who received an appendectomy, usually in a year's time span pre-COVID. But you know, now it's being questioned that does this fall into a more urgent diagnosis or is it still considered the emergent condition that most of us still treat it as? So you know, current beliefs report reported by pediatric surgeons in the US most of them, so about 92%, believe that postponement of an appendectomy overnight for non-perforated appendicitis does not significantly increase the risk of perforation. So a multi-center study done a couple of years ago pre-COVID also found no increase in the risk of perforation related to ED wait times. And this was like with using a wait time of like less than 12 hours. So some things that I just wanted to continue to highlight here about appendicitis is that young children will often have non-classic presentations of appendicitis. We see so much abdominal pain and it's hard to make sure sometimes that you don't miss that one that could be appendicitis. But I really wanna hammer home those children who are that age four, age three, it can be very difficult to be able to assess them sometimes and really get a thorough abdominal exam. So is that pain really in the right lower quadrant? Are they gonna still present with anorexia? Are they gonna still have fever or vomit as a part of those symptoms? They may not, and they may not be able to vocalize as well of where their pain is. So just making sure we do our due diligence in our exams and then having a high gestalt or thinking about P, uh, P, appendicitis whenever you see those patients that are presenting with abdominal pain. The other thing I wanted to make sure we talked about is that equivocal ultrasounds for appendicitis should not lead to a CT if your suspicion is actually extremely low. If you really think this is more falling to the lines of gastroenteritis, you think it's falling into the lines of constipation, then maybe you don't have to commit that child to advanced imaging and radiation if it's not necessary. And then the other thing we want to make sure that we talk about is in the urgent care setting or in the ED setting, and a child is febrile and they're still presenting and with persistent abdominal pain, you should strongly consider getting a uh, ultrasound to evaluate for appendicitis. So the pediatric appendicitis score, which was adopted from the adult Alvarado score, it can be a useful tool. And so you have things to be able to focus on is their movement when they're jumping around, that car ride in over every bump, were they in extreme pain? Are they not eating? Is there fever? Are they having vomiting? Where is that tenderness? And then if you get your labs and continue to risk stratify, you can also add points for presence of leukocytosis, if there is a neutrophil predominance, and again, going back to your exam and history taken on how that changed. However, I do want to point out 
that these tools are tools for risk stratification or for imaging. This alone still wouldn't change the need for a surgical consult or like surgical decision making. I think that's still an opinion that is uh, performed by the assessment of your pediatric surgery team. Okay, and so also a hot topic uh, currently in appendicitis, we want to make sure that we talk about is the non-surgical management of appendicitis. So although this is an option, this is still a decision that's made after surgical consultation. I don't think that any of us have changed our practice where we are making this decision at a clinic visit or deciding to do medical management for appendicitis in the urgent care setting. Um, there have been multiple studies that have been published in the last six months addressing non-surgical management of appendicitis. And I will say what has been a common theme is that there is still a risk of recurrence. And when it does reoccur, there is a percentage, a percentage of patients who may perf or they may present more ill than that initial episode. So I think that's really important to arm our families with, with making decisions. And that's a discussion that is usually had with the surgical team. And after you obtain imaging on if they're going to make that decision to manage them non-surgically and with medical management, or if they're gonna take them to the OR. Okay, so continuing to move on through those diagnoses that we're still presenting through the pandemic. And it's our favorite mechanical cause of bowel obstruction, intussusception. So the big issue with intussusception that can be so dangerous too, is that in those cases where the bowel is telescoping, it can constrict the blood supply to the intestine. And that portion of what I just said there is the most concerning, as that could potentially lead to short gut and drastically change the quality of life of a pediatric patient. And it's another reason that this diagnosis is a top diagnosis of litigation in pediatric emergency medicine. So it's another thing that we really don't want to miss when we have that child that comes in with abdominal pain, we're often thinking about intussusception and evaluating for that. So as you guys know, most causes are idiopathic. However, 10% can come from infections. It can come from altered GI motility. We have seen it with Meckel's diverticulums there or other masses that may be present within the um, abdominal cavity or their polyps that serve as that lead point. Sometimes there is hyperplasia of the pyre patches within the GI tract, and that served as a lead point. And even a complication of cystic fibrosis in the susception cases have been documented. And a board favorite, like the question that stems from uh, presentations related to HSP or IgA vasculitis as a cause of intussusception. So these are all things that we think about whenever these types of patients present. And it's super common. When we do see it, every 2,000 children, one to four are diagnosed with intussusception. It's the most common cause of abdominal emergency in patients from ages six months to three years. But again, I don't want us to put our blinders up to the kid with episodic abdominal pain and they're six. Epidom ep episodic abdominal pain and they might be 10. Anecdotally speaking, the oldest that I've seen in the deception in my short career so far has been at age 13. And it was pretty impressive. Like he even had a Zatelli's target sign on uh, abdominal imaging. So I don't want to, we, we think about intussusception from ages six months to three years. It can occur younger, it can occur older, but those are the age range that we think about it specifically. So again, like just to go through our slide, don't forget the triad of bilious emesis. Is there a presence of abdominal mass and current jelly stools? Sorry for the typo. But guys, that's only really seen in about 20% of cases of intussusception. So that's another thing that I wanted to point out too when we talk about the age range of abdominal pain that's presenting. Let's also talk about our children who have developmental delays or maybe on the autistic spectrum. Another case that I experienced was a child who was autistic and older than the usual presentation for intussusception. They were about age eight or nine. And when they presented, again, episodic abdominal pain and their lead point actually ended up being uh, adrenal gland mass. And so things to think about that every single presentation might not be that uh, classic current jelly stool, vomiting or abdominal pain. Um, children with intussusception may arrest during their air enemas, and that is extremely concerning, which is another reason why this is considered an emergency and that reduction is key. 
And I think too, we wanna make sure that we talk about that it can recur in approximately 5% of cases in the first 48 hours, which is another reason why we watch these children very closely. So here is a figure, this is an ultrasound presentation of a targetoid lesion that's affiliated with um, the findings of interceptional ultrasound. And I just wanna point out, ultrasound is the modality of choice um, whenever we're evaluating for this condition. It has an accuracy rate of 100% and a sensitivity about 98 to 100%. Many folks will obtain plain films just as a part of their um, abdominal pain presentation, information gathering, and for diagnostic purposes. But I also do wanna point out is that if there is distal colonic air, sure, that's great. We don't, they might not be obstructed. You can't interpret that as an absence of interception. The only way you can probably lean towards making that uh, or ruling out in a susception from a plain film, you really need to make sure that air is present in the cecum. But I think that with ultrasound having a 100% accuracy rate and such a high sensitivity, get the ultrasound rather than relying on any other type of imaging modality to diagnose in a susception. And to address management in the ED setting, per a systemic review by the uh, American uh, Pediatric Surgical Association, some people feel that, you know, with the irritation or the inflammation that may be occurring intermittently in the gut, do they need antibiotics? However, prophylactic antibiotics do not decrease complications that are associated with interception. You know, many of these kids present with small bowel, small bowel in the susception, which treatment, which would be an air or barium enema, would have little effect. Um, however, those patients who are presented with severe symptoms of interception, persistent abdominal pain, they're vomiting, they're not able to tolerate PO, even in small bowel, small bowel interception, those are still patients that I consider candidate for observation admissions, and especially if the episodes are prolonged. We also need to make sure that we are aware that there's a recurrence rate of anywhere between 18 and 20% of those episodes. And since we're talking about treatment for an interception, air enemas or pneumatic enemas are still superior than fluid enema reductions. And just going back, giving you some evidence, a meta-analysis that studied over 30,000 patients and more than 100 studies still showed that air enemas had a higher success rate at 76% compared to 67% with like a fluid enema. Now, other studies have documented air, air enemas even having a higher success rate in about 80% ranges. So unlike the discussions, guys, around appendicitis, where it's like, is this emergent? Is it, is it urgent or emergent? Can we wait to go to the OR in the morning? Nobody's having that discussion around interception. It is still strongly supported that prompt reduction should occur. And there, there was a, uh, a multi-tertiary care center study done in 2019 that observed with each hour of delay that was associated with having the reduction performed, there was a 5.2 increase in the probability that a surgical intervention would eventually be required. So take home point, do not delay evaluation of these patients, direct them to a pediatric ED or a emergency care facility immediately, and preferably a center with the capability to be able to perform the reduction. So each facility could have their own requirements surrounding reductions and how that happens. But for the most part, it requires a pediatric radiologist. They're gonna need their staff and team of techs It'll also make sure that a pediatric nurse or um, somewhere along the lines to be able to support the child during the case is also necessary to have. Again, going back to the previous slide that these cases can have complications with reductions and even arrest. So you just wanna make sure that you're prepared for those patients to have that procedure done. Now, the complication of reductions are, is perforation, and that rate can vary like 0.5 to 3% from what I've seen from recent studies. But I think what's really uh, meaningful to mention right now, and especially to plead the case for admission for these children after their reduction is performed, is if for some reason the child is less than three months of age and they have a documented interception that you're going to try to reduce with an air enema, if the child is older than five years of age, that's another reason to consider um, an observation after their reduction. 
if the symptoms have had a longer duration. So if they've been presented with episodic abdominal pain for about two to three days, if there's hematochesia, if the patient is dehydrated, or if there's evidence of an SBL playing films, those children should strongly push for an observation admission afterwards. Now, there have been studies and talks of like, can I send this child home after an air enema? As long as there is an observation period, that's important. But for those uh, risk factors I mentioned before, you really want to strongly consider admission. And then also, just again to point out, there is a recurrence rate that's significant in the first 24 to 48 hours afterwards. And there hasn't been a ton of studies that actually really prospectively address this and um, it specifically when it comes from a discharge from the ED after those settings. So for my practice and what I recommend is for observation after these procedures. Okay, so we've gotten through most of the top emergencies that we have seen throughout the pandemic. We talked a little bit about fever and its association with sepsis and shock. We were able to get through some of those surgical emergencies related to um, the abdominal system, including intussusception and um, appendicitis. I want to pause here, maybe Dr. Corey, if before I talk about one of my last emergencies, before we transition to some of the urgencies, if there were any questions or things in the chat. Thank you. Yes, there, there were some great questions. Um, I think going back to your discussion about sepsis. There is a question asking about when is lumbar puncture indicated in the work of, of, sep, of, sepsis, of sepsis in the pediatric patient. And I think also maybe highlighting um, the difference by age might be helpful as well. Okay, so one hot topic that's been uh, with at least the AAP is that we now have new febrile infant guidelines. And so if your institution have adopted those guidelines, things have changed, but it's still really pretty much the same and pretty straightforward for the last 20 to 30 years per se. Um, for children or neonates under uh, 28 days, they're still requiring the whole workup. However, those moments on like if you need an LP or not, some of that can come from your gestalt, like is the kid sick enough that you think that it would be beneficial for them to have that LP done is something you should strongly consider. And even if they're out of that 28 day range, if a baby is ill, there those things that we talked about before, like they're not like themselves, behavior changes, they're not feeding the same ways. Those are things that can push me over to thinking more about LP and using those labs to help you risk stratify. If the patient has a leukocytosis that's present, should be considering an LP at that, portion, at that point. Or if you don't feel comfortable with your facility with initiating that in your emergency department, can you reach out to your hospitalist team to help you with decision making for that? Can you reach out to your ICU teams that are going to be continuing to care for the patient? And should they have an LP once they're more stable? I think it's a totally appropriate conversation to have. Because the last thing that I want to do in a kid, even if I might even think it might be a viral cause, for example, an RSV, RSV bronchiolytic who's looking very puny, very ill appearing, but with the increased risk of apnea that might be happening and the positioning that needs to occur for a tap, maybe this is someone I want to stabilize more from a respiratory standpoint before obtaining an LP. And, and as you get through the guidelines a little bit older, so moving from 28 days and below, where it's super straightforward, to you get into those gray areas of taking care of patients that are 60 days or taking care of patients that are 90 days, still obtaining some type of inflammatory marker in those kids or your concern for sepsis and using those to help you risk stratify if they need a tap. And again, their appearance. And again, as they get older and you're able to assess for altered mental status or if that child is seizing, like things that are tilting you towards more of an encephalopathic presentation or meningitic presentation to go ahead and obtain that in the ED setting. Great, thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, another question, uh, as, uh, one of our attendees wonders that if you cannot get an IV to get a blood culture, Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate to start empiric antibiotics? 
Oh, that was such a good question. And it's something that we're faced with, I feel like all the time in the emergency setting. Although we're really good and we have the capability of point of care ultrasound uh, for a guided IV placement at times, sometimes those nurses are busy and far between. Or if you're in the clinic setting, what should you do? Should you go ahead and give that IM ceftriaxone? Again, if a child is very ill appearing and you think you're making that best decision for that patient and you're not able to obtain the culture, getting that first dose in, I can completely understand. However, sometimes I have the luxury of being able to, again, talk to my ICU colleagues and my hospitalist team on like, hey, I cannot get access. I have been able to get a urine culture. I've been able to get this culture, but not blood culture. How, what's your comfort level on how you feel watching this child off of antibiotics? And again, I think that using your labs can help you with making that decision. Let's say you were able to get a straight stick, but you weren't able to get enough blood for the cultures. It would, if the child is super ill appearing, extremely febrile, I would think given that dose of ceftriaxone would be appropriate and still asking them to be monitored with an IM dose. Uh, but again, if I'm since I'm not caring for that child the entire length of their illness, I always want to make sure at that point I'm running into access issues. Or I'm going to have to make a decision that's going to affect how they're managed on the floor. I always reach out to my hospitalist team and like, here is where we are. I'm looking at a very ill child. I think I should give antibiotics versus I'm looking at labs that the numbers are concerning, but this child is giving me high five or smiling at mom and chugging away on their bottle. I think I wanna wait on antibiotic therapy. Do you feel the same? Thank you for that. Yeah, it sounds like it's a little bit of a collaboration and um, kind of considering what the actual child looks like in front of you and not just, not just the numbers. Um, I think we have one more question that we can maybe get to and then we'll continue on. But um, you referenced, you talked about a study um, about appendicitis perforation risk and ED time. Mm -hmm. um, if you happen to have that up on top of your head, it's okay. And if not, um, we can something we can send out to people later or we can put in the chat later. <laughs> It's not a problem. It is at the end of my presentation and our references. And so I believe those will be available at the end of our presentation. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay. So my last emergency that I just felt like as a PIM doctor, I could not let you guys leave here without reviewing is anaphylaxis. And I'll be brief because we want to make sure that we get through some of the urgencies and some of the interesting cases that we have prepared for you guys. So... <clears throat> I think one of the big things, anaphylaxis, you think is for the most part, like, oh, this is straightforward. Like the kid has hives, they have this rash. I'm going to be able to, you know, visibly be able to see this rash is worsening. And then I have another system that's involved. Of course, I'm going to go ahead and give them the EpiPen. So just to reinforce, if there is any concerning symptoms like that with strider, hoarseness, respiratory distress, and especially hypotension, of course, this is going to require rapid intervention. But I do want to mention that the delayed use of IM epi is associated with higher morbidity and mortality. So some of us are in fantastic programs where we have the luxury of having triage protocols and things that are activated up front for allergic reactions. So maybe that child go ahead and they get a dose of Benadryl up front. That isn't going to help with their the hypotension that's associated with anaphylaxis, and that's not going to help with that bimodal distribution or that second peak that we see, that, that post-reaction that we see, unfortunately related to anaphylaxis if it's not treated with epi. So epi, 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 if any point that I can bring home, I really want you guys to remember that if you're treating anaphylaxis, if you're concerned for anaphylaxis, please provide epinephrine. Diphenhydramine, your Benadryl, and your steroids, those are adjunct therapy. The child must get the epi. Okay. And then also, let's make sure we consider atypical presentations for anaphylaxis. So, for example, like the teenager that comes in and they're like, oh, I got hives and I took Benadryl, but I'm better. But they're complaining of persistent abdominal pain. They're complaining of persistent nausea. They can't keep anything down. Or the kid that has just that vomiting alone and in deeper history taking, you find out they had a new exposure. Those can be those atypical presentations of anaphylaxis that will also, you should need to consider giving a dose of epinephrine. And then prior to discharge, even though our EpiPens and our EpiPen Junior packs, they're super colorful, it seems intuitive, it's lots of directions on the actual packaging itself, 
please provide some type of training to families before you just send them out with an epi script. Some of our pharmacies and pharmacists are really great and they're able to make sure that they have that type of hands-on training, but taking the couple of minutes to really explain how to give an EpiPen and how to administer the medication could be really helpful and how these outcomes can happen if it happens again for these kiddos. Okay, so I just wanna transition a little bit because of time's sake to talk about some of the urgencies that I felt like uh, pediatricians that I had polled and also kind of reflecting back to those COVID numbers on things kiddos were still coming to the emergency department and to urgent cares for. So minor trauma is still something that we all take care of in either the clinic setting, urgent care setting, or in pediatric EDs. And when I think minor trauma, I think abrasions, contusions, and those mild closed head injuries. Although going back to the beginning of our slides, in the international studies, there was some concern for more violent head injuries and abusive head traumas. So whenever you are taking care of those kiddos, I think it is something to consider about uh, the mechanism the history of it all, and those red flags of abusive head trauma, of course, you should make sure you um, uh, uh, provide higher level of care for those children. But simple abrasions, you're talking about aggressive irrigation with saline, maybe some prophylactic bacitration to treat those. If your urgent care facility has x-ray capability, maybe those types of injuries of arm pain, knee pain, leg pain, those things can be evaluated in the urgent setting. However, if there are deformities associated with those areas of injuries, if there is significant swelling, those are cases where I, would, I may tend to send to an emergency department just because I know they might have some of those specialty services such as orthopedics or the PIM provider or EM provider that's able to reduce those uh, lower um, acuity fractures rather than what can be done in an urgent care. But if you end up seeing those kiddos in an urgent care, one thing I want to make sure we always encourage is to send along with imaging. So the CDs are always really helpful. Just the read alone won't be enough to help us in the um, in the ED set. We would have to repeat those imaging. So if you are able to send along with those children from an urgent setting or outpatient RAD setting, sending the imaging along with the child is super helpful. So to talk about a little bit more about closed head injuries, the figures in the, this slide and the next slide comes from the California ASAP Head Injury Toolkit, and it's based on PCARN criteria. So a validated decision-making um, tool that really kind of assess the risk of TBIs and if this child needs imaging or not. So between 20 to 60% of children presenting to EDs with head injuries, unfortunately undergo head CTs in the US. And even though this is less than 1% of children have a, a GCS that's 14 or 15 that have any type of injury that even requires an intervention. So that's a really unfortunate missed point where we're exposing children to radiation and we don't have to. So we use the PCARN head injury prediction rule a lot, and it can significantly improve the value we deliver to our patients by reducing unnecessary CT scans in children and reducing radiation exposure, decreasing the cost of that visit, and I think what's really important to our families and, and parents, giving them that time back, because even though CTs are fast, we still have to wait for interpretation and things of that nature. Here at Stanford, we are fortunate enough to have uh, MRI capabilities to evaluate head trauma. So we eliminate it all together, the need for radiation exposure and um, for with head CTs. However, there are cases where the child may be decompensating or I'm more suspicious for a skull fracture and maybe not so much a TBI, that CT will be more sensitive than MR. But since we do have that capability here at Stanford with a quick traumatic uh, protocol for MRIs, we are able to scan without using radiation. This is still a great de clinical decision uh, tool to help make those decisions though, because everybody doesn't have that capability. So there are two divisions of this scoring, children who are younger than two and children who are older than two. So if they have a GCS less than 15, you feel a step off 
or there is some altered mental status, the child isn't responding as they usually would, these people have a, these patients have a high risk, 4.4% of a TBI. And then you can break it down and continue to follow the algorithm. But what I think is important to point out in children younger than two years of age is that parental concern and involvement is a part of the pathway. So if they are extremely concerned that they're not acting normally, that is at least an observation period complained, uh, compared to uh, getting a CT. And then also we wanna make sure we consider the mechanism of injuries and if this should be a trauma activation per se, rather than this is just, I kind of fell from standing and bonked my head. Fall greater than three feet, is this related to an MBA? Was this person struck by an object? So these are really helpful to be able to help making those decisions. And then the blue figure here focuses on children who are um, older than two. But one thing I wanted to make sure that we mention with children who are less than two, we put a lot of emphasis, I feel, on occipital uh, hematomas that could trigger like, oh, you know what, we definitely need to make sure that there's an observation period or that there should be some type of head imaging that happens with that type of injury. However, I err on the side of caution with that and children who are really like less than a year of age with any hematoma. So whether it's a parietal hematoma, a temporal hematoma, I don't only focus on an occipital hematoma. Frontal hematomas, I tend to obs more, but if I'm seeing any type of hematoma in other areas, especially if the mechanism, the described mechanism isn't consistent with developmental um, possibility of that child, or if the history is super concerning for a abusive head trauma, those I tend to image more actually than just relying on how they fall into a PCAR. But for two and older, getting back to our slides, those children, it's still the same um, walkthrough, but this one doesn't put as a big of an em emphasis on the parental uh, input for shared decision making, but really focuses on the symptoms of vomiting, loss of consciousness, this child, they, are they reporting a severe headache and again, mechanism of injury to help be able to make some of those decisions. So one other thing I think is always a big topic of concern for um, providers who might be in a clinic or they might be in an urgent care setting is, do I glue this or can I sew this? And then on top of that, there are many other factors that go into kind of these superficial wounds and lacerations and injuries on uh, providing the unique services that we do for PEDS patients. So does this child need a little bit of extra TLC? Do they need child life? Does your facility have a papoose to kind of treat, to, to kind of keep arms and hands out of the way so you don't injure yourself while you're trying to do a repair? Or does this child need a sedation and I'm at an urgent care and I don't have the capabilities of being able to perform that? Those all go into the decision-making on where this child should present and who's gonna be best to be be able to do this type of repair. But to me, it's really easy to kind of make the decision on, should I glue this or should I sew this? So like the far, my right side of the screen um, shows just superficial abrasions, right? You're not gonna sew that, that one's easy, that one's straightforward. You're not gonna go and try to stitch that. You're just gonna clean and discharge. The other one here on the far, well, my left side of the screen is one that I feel like will be questioned a lot. So. It looks almost linear, and that's kind of like a good cause of like, oh, you should be able to approximate this well and apply a dermal bond. But to me, it's gaping enough. To me, I actually wouldn't repair that with skin glue. I would actually sew in this case. Anything that presents gaping more so, I go ahead and try to sew versus an applied dermal bond. Another uh, feature of wounds that likely shouldn't get dermal bond, if they're irregular shape or stellate, I've found that those don't really hold together as well with dermal bond. And then also um, wounds that cross the tension line. So the figure in the center of the screen, if it's more vertical and crossing those lines, they already have a high likelihood of scarring. And with tension, that area is gonna like continue to move. And I don't want that to become separated during the time period if it's not held long enough for the adhesive to set. So oftentimes I will sew those, but if they're going along your tension lines, they will be a perfect candidate for skin glue. So I hope that helps a little bit and we're trying to determine what to sew, what to glue. And again, always keeping kind of like that thought process in your mind of how to approach these wounds 
what type of support this child is going to need and referring them to that appropriate care. Okay, I do think respiratory distress is always a topic with pediatricians when they're taking that call from home, which can be really difficult, right? Because we don't usually give those type of management things over the phone. If you can't lay eyes on a patient, it's really more appropriate, I feel, to just go ahead and refer them to a provider that can actually evaluate them. We have been fortunate with the use of telemedicine to be able to look at patients and be able to see respiratory distress and see what's going on a little bit better. But I just want to point out a couple of points when it comes to trying to determine if respiratory distress needs an urgent care evaluation and management versus pediatric emergency medicine evaluation. And the biggest thing that I found is that if the child is having intermittent respiratory distress or you find that the respiratory distress is transient, this is something that likely can be managed in that urgent care setting or something that can be managed at home. Is it getting better with suctioning? Is it getting better with steamy shower use? Is this a happy bronchiolytic who is still taking their bottles and feeds, having wet diapers? That's not the kid I would say, oh my goodness, you need to go to the ED for evaluation immediately. I would still try to continue to get them through those supportive care measures at home. Also, if there's a lack of persistent accessory muscle use, can also be really reassuring that this is more of a milder case of respiratory distress and would continue to do well with supportive care. Also, if they're able, again, like I mentioned with the bronchiolytic, they're able to feed without difficulty, or if you feel like their speech isn't being affected by it, again, home medications or supportive care first before maybe an urgent or emergent visit. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and see if there's any more questions, Dr. Corey, that may have came up, or if we can go into our cases in the last 30 minutes that we're here. We do have a, a few questions I think that might be really um, interesting to discuss at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I only I just want to say as a pulmonologist, I completely agree with uh, the respiratory distress. Those are one of the most common calls that obviously that I get. So I think that that was all great advice, Dr. Smith. Um, so um, the question here, I think, um, talking about for we have um, EMS pre-hospital care providers, so and paramedic students. So. Um, I guess kind of looking at uh, what's kind of some good takeaways of how to sounds like really kind of prepare what to look for, how to get, you know, these patients safely to you, Dr. Smith, Smith. and then also just thinking another and follow up to this question too was um, looking at the importance of pathophysiology and critical thinking for the paramedic students, I think has been a focus of this person um, for her students, but um, I guess it's just kind of wondering how do we put this together? What's kind of the big takeaways you have for for pre-hospital providers. Okay, thanks Dr. Curry. I am so excited you guys are here listening to. We interact with you guys on an everyday basis. And I do wanna make sure that I put in a plug that we are also here for medical direction. Whenever you're in the field and you're having that hard time putting things together for a pediatric patient, you can always call your landline for the nearest pediatric ED. And there's usually an emergency backline that gets you into direct contact with the pediatric emergency medicine attending that is available. Or if you're calling your closest ED with an EM attending who's able to provide medical direction if you're ever extremely concerned about a patient. Or if you run into those situations where you have a family that is very uncomfortable maybe with traveling by ambulance, but you feel they really do need to travel by ambulance, if you ever need that type of support or reinforcement, you can always call to get that additional medical direction support. But you make a good, uh, that's a very good question that you brought up about making the assessment of the pediatric patient. And I think with any kind of like PALS preparation or class or even BLS, we often talk talk about like the pediatric assessment triad with looking at how a patient appears using their vital signs in your exam to really kind of piece together on where this child is in their course of illness. And then you have to kind of make a decision on the, the snapshot that you're seeing. Are they going to get worse? Or are they not going to get worse? Some of this unfortunately has to come with some experience of being able to see patients, but some of this also, you are very capable of being able to make those assessments. So again, kind of recognizing the differences by age of pediatric vital signs, I think can help in the field. Oftentimes, uh, I think that one thing that's lacking, uh, even getting 
fever or getting a temperature in patients can be really helpful in EMS settings. And oftentimes I found that that's a major portion that's missing in kind of like our EMS assessment and paperwork. So using that to help make decisions too, and having that knowledge that sometimes the heart rate is going to be up. Sometimes they will be in respiratory distress or working harder to breathe or look ill apparent in the presence of a fever. So feeling comfortable administering Tylenol, administering Motrin to be able to help with your assessment in the field on where this kid is going, or even gleaning that information from the parent that they've already done this intervention, their fever has responded, but yet their vitals are this. Like to me, that's a sicker kid that would then need your uh, assessment and being brought to the ED for further management. So some of this is gonna take some exposure to these patients in the field, but I think as long as you're continuing to use the assessment of the child, how they interact with families again too is another really good thing to help you make decisions in the field. If you can't just make that assessment off of their vital signs alone, are they clinging to the parents? Can they fight you off? That's another really good sign that these kids likely are not in shock or hypotensive. Now, if the child is more listless, they are sleeping, they are tired, they are, their tone is different, they are, they are limp. These are things along with the vital signs in that overall history taken in the beginning that you'll be able to put together and make a decision. Is this child sick or not sick? Do I need to take you to the emergency room? Can you stay here with your family and continue to have supportive care at home? I hope that's what I, I answered your question. Thank you. Hopefully, please uh, feel free to add in there if you have um, more questions for Dr. Smith. But I, I agree. So, like getting your gestalt in combination with the objective data, I think are really key things. So, thank you for that. A um, lot of good questions. I'm going to try to just ask a few that I think just to dovetail on what you just, just talked about, um, or, you know, a couple points ago. Okay. A, a, a person has a question about using uh, glue on lacerations on the fingers or digits um, in the hands. What okay. are your thoughts on that? I'm still the same. It depends, like palm or surface can kind of be tricky, right? Because you have all these superficial layers and it's hard to tell, like, is it deep? Is it not deep? Again, if it's very linear, it's able to approximate. Those are things you can try to do with glue. Um, the dorsum of the hand is a little bit better, I feel, especially because, again, this is going to be high use, high touch, like you're going to be in water, things like time, the, the adhesive actually may break down a little bit more quickly than what was suturing. Um, they might last a little bit longer. So you might want to consider a non-absorbable suture instead of with skin glue. Um, and again, to me, the more important thing is with the hand lacerations, it's high risk of infection. So if anything that's on a deeper level, do they need any type of antibiotic therapy, making sure they have a bacitracin prescription to be able to give that. A lot of it just depends on the appearance of the wound, the depth of the wound. Definitely not saying you can't use glue on the hands, but it may vary by the type of wound that's involved and where it is. One thing to remember though, is when you are repairing Palmer um, wounds and their depth, if you do decide to sew rather than use glue as well, be careful that you don't entrap any type of tendons or anything superficial in that area because you don't want to inadvertently cause any types of retractions or uh, not retractions, sorry, contractures. So always want to make sure you also think of that but you can use, think glue for more superficial things and then um, things that are linear. If things are irregular, I kind of avoid skin glue. Excellent, thank you. Well, kind of um, in relation to that, so let's say you do get an infection and you do get an abscess. We have a question um, from um, one of our attendees about what about um, expectations for outpa outpatient management of abscesses? Person says they tend to feel nervous without access to an ultrasound prior to draining? And then also kind of what do you recommend in regards to packing? Ah, oh, very good questions. I'm so happy you guys are asking these. So abscesses can be hard and I definitely understand your concern when you don't have access to ultrasound. I have the luxury of having point of care ultrasound. So for me, a good candidate for an incision and drainage is an abscess that is uh, less than two centimeters or a centimeter from the surface and also less than one to two centimeters wide. If anything is larger than that, 
anything that's deeper than that, I'm actually even considering surgical management and evaluation of that abscess. Because even if you think about an 11 blade scalpel, that's only about a centimeter and a half from tip to the plastic handle of that scalpel. So if I can't even reach it, those are things that of course I, would, I wouldn't even manage that as an outpatient, I would have surgery evaluate. So let's say when to dive into antibiotics and things more so of that nature, I'm always more concerned when I have an abscess and the patient is febrile. That's also a reason why I'll get surgery involved because does this patient need IV antibiotics at this point? Is the fever related to this abscess that has now become seeded? Um, and there are bacteria in the bloodstream, and this is why they're presented with fever, pain, and abscess. So I think that that's also something important to consider rather than the size of something and how to IND. Things that are very superficial and small, again, the definitive treatment is an incision and drainage. Just throwing antibiotics at something is not really going to help it if it's actually a fluid collection that you visually see fluctuants in the wound. So those are ones that I would no problem have my 11 blade scalpel. Oftentimes in urgent cares, there may be um, the little lancets to try to open those wounds. Those are great for like a comedone or something that's pimple size. But if you're getting to something that's half a centimeter or more than a centimeter, you need to, you really need to IND it. So the, again, um, a centimeter or so is something that I would open. And literature has been not all over the place, but really doesn't really strongly recommend for packing. If something is deep, if something you notice once you opened it, there was tons of loculations. You had to get in there and really break up the abscess more. And the pocket is deeper than just superficial. Those you should pack, of course, and let it heal from the bottom up, which is what packing is really great at. Uh, and you, it can prevent kind of like the seroma formation and things afterwards. But again, it takes a lot of uh, teaching and counseling with the family on removing slowly each day over X amount of days. So that's always something important to consider. Very superficial ones, I wouldn't try to pack. If something is deeper, you have a cavity, I would pack those. And then I also would use um, iota form packing and not just like gauze. It doesn't have any type of bacteriostatic type properties. The other thing that was also mentioned in those studies, like to pack or not to pack, even irrigation, not to irrigate. Again, the best thing for those um, abscess were to drain the abscess, get it draining. The saline, flushing, um, the packing, all those things were kind of like, okay, it doesn't really change the management or the outcome as much as what actually IND in the abscess does. Great, thank you so much. We have a, maybe we'll do one more question because I know you have some cases you definitely want to go through, but uh, we just have so many great questions. Okay, um, there uh, is a, a, a question a little bit um, different than what you've talked about, but um, asking about what are the current guidelines for submersion injuries? So gasping after being underwater, symptomatic mm. versus asymptomatic. And maybe you don't have those off the top of your head, but we can, what you have. You know, I am so grateful that you said submersion injury. So I think we have moved away so much from these erroneous terms, right, of dry drowning, almost drowning like those. These are submersive injuries, and I prefer to use the terms non-fatal drownings, right? So as far as like specific guidelines, I don't know if anything has come out more recently in the pandemic periods, but one thing I will say that there is a concern just nationally with the social distancing and things that have happened with uh, limited activities of children that they haven't gotten swim lessons. So we have seen a spike in submersion injuries, unfortunately. And so I think this is another plug for injury prevention. And at this point, really getting our children back into swim lessons, but even more so safe supervision from children with uh, safe supervision of children in these type of water settings. And then also the people who are supervised them to also be ha to have some type of exposure into resuscitative measures or the, the supervising uh, person also has some type of degree of swimming like what we what we hate to hear is that you know a child unfortunately had a submersion injury and death and then so did the parent because they also couldn't swim so I just had to put in myself 
my injury prevention plug there. But going back to your question, as far as specific guidelines for submersion injuries, I think the biggest thing is, again, the kind of going back to like ABCs, right, on how severe the injury is. Did the patient require resuscitative measures at the scene? Did chest compressions have to be delivered? Were breaths giving? These are all things that would promote evaluation then at an emergency department observation. Um, the phenomenon that usually happens with the sequelae associated with uh, almost like a chemical pneumonitis that could happen after the exposure of pool water into the lungs or seawater into the lungs is what we worry about. And sometimes we, not, we might not be able to capture that on initial in on initial imaging, um, the changes that are associated. And then over time, the fear is that they present with almost like an ARDS type picture and respiratory distress related to that pneumonitis that develops later. So I think the safest thing as far as what to do for these children is an observation period. And that can be within the emergency department, totally appropriate. And again, depending on the mechanism, how they present it, going through those ABCs, and you can decide if they would need an observation like hospitalization or if they need ICU level care for the potential of, um, of worsening uh, respiratory presentations. Now, as far as like really specific guidelines, I don't have any of the data currently off the top of my head on where we are with literature, but that's usually my approach to like a non-fatal drowning. Great, thank you, Dr. Smith. I think we have just a couple other questions, but I'll, I can we can let you go through the cases and then maybe come back to these. Um, yeah. Yeah. That would be okay. Let's do the cases and then it's not that many folks, so I don't want you guys to feel ignored. I definitely want to get to your questions, but um, the cases are also um, built from. Uh, feedback from community pediatricians and those attendees who have submitted cases. We just want to make sure we get through a couple of those. It's only three, and then we'll come back to your questions. So I think you all can all see still that uh, case one that's up. And so this is kind of a hot topic I feel right now. Um, I've gotten many calls and questions surrounding melatonin. So our first case, this is a five-year-old female presenting 30 minutes after consumption of five one milligram melatonin tablets. And these are her presenting vital signs. So her heart rate's 120, respiratory rate's 27, her blood pressure is normal, and she is statting 100% on room air. This is common, a presentation, unfortunately, after ingestions. We see them very quickly um, at times before uh, oral medications you think would be able to break down appropriately. But the side effects uh, specifically related to melatonin ingestions could be excessive sleepiness. The children may present with nausea. They may have vomiting, GI upset, or even some stomach pain. Um, the dose ranges, though, for melatonin is variable. It can be like from half a milligram up to five milligrams. And guidelines are loosely formed around melatonin um, use. And that's um, because a child's circadian rhythm is still developing. And some, medic some doses have effect versus, you know, this is something that has to be titrated up. The dose that this child currently ingested as a five-year-old who I suspect is probably um, greater than 15 or around 20 kilos or so, then they will, maybe not 20 kilos or so, but at least uh, 10 to 15 kilos, that they should not have, this isn't a toxic dose, uh, a five milligram ingestion. And especially within 30 minutes, I'm not expecting to really see any types of symptoms. Now, over the last 10 years, pediatric ingestions have increased significantly for some reason, specifically with melatonin, like greater than 500% increase. There were like 260,000 ingestions since 2012, and that was reported by the CDC. And a large portion of these children were just like this one. These children usually present asymptomatic. So like almost 82% of those cases had no symptoms at all. About 14% or so needed to be admitted to the hospital. Now, those that needed critical type of intervention, likely for like the excessive sleepiness, they were concerned that they weren't protecting their airway maybe or something like that. Only five of those cases require like mechanical ventilation. And then the, the, um, the causes surrounding the two children of the 260,000 ingestions that were reported that actually passed away 
it's kind of vague. Those children that um, died from a melatonin ingestion, they were less than the age of two. They were very young and they occurred in the home, like the death occurred in the home. So still a lot of things surrounding that that we really don't know about. And so for me, and I think of melatonin, I think of more kind of like maybe some mild GI upset, maybe some sleepiness, but more than likely these children are gonna be asymptomatic. In older kids though, like what if an older kid came in who had some type of psychiatric um, disorder that they were being treated for, maybe with an SSRI or something like that. I do think it's important to note that some formulations of melatonin, particularly I think the chewable tablet forms of melatonin, and maybe Dr. Akori can correct me if I'm wrong, some, form some formulations um, contain serotonin. And if that's the case, you could place a child at risk for serotonin toxicity, especially if they're on any other medications that can compound the amount of serotonin that's present. And so that's why you might see some other like CNS presentation symptoms. Uh, so I think that that's important to remember. I think the big thing surrounding these ingestions from an urgent setting, right, because the child is asymptomatic and potentially with a one milligram tablet ingestion, this is where poison control would be extremely helpful. You'll be able to, the number is the same across the country and they usually give out uh, extremely useful advice. And what I like most about poison control is that they also do a follow-up call. And it's not just a follow-up call to like the prison emergency department, like they follow up with the families at home too. So it's a nice uh, resource to be able to use whenever there's concern there. Okay, and case two is the one that I really wanted to get to. And thank you to the attendee who submitted this. I know it's, can, it's always um, frustrating to be able to go through a case that didn't have a great outcome. And I appreciate your vulnerability and the want to be able to try to learn from this case, to be able to see things a little bit more clearly or differently. Uh, we really appreciate that. But one thing I want to also mention, too, is that hindsight sometimes is like 2020. We see things so much clearly after things have um, occurred. And I don't want you to feel that you missed something terribly or that, you know, you, this is it could have been progression of disease that happened in this case. But I'm just really thankful that you're willing to share this. And let's see what we can kind of learn from this and what we can um, gather from this discussion. So case two that was submitted um, from an area um, internationally um, in the outside of Sri Lanka, it was a 17 month old male uh, presented with vomiting and diarrhea for about five days. At the time of presentation, the stools were des described as watery. They were a little mucoid as well. And the presenting um, vital signs here, the 17 month old had a heart rate of 174 beats per minute. Respirations were at 45, blood pressure 60 over 43 and O2 saturation of 93%. So bear with me as I go through the case a little bit more to tell you a little bit more information about it. So, <clears throat> this patient was evaluated at that time. They didn't have any blood in their stool. And then further in their illness, the child became more irritable and had an unquenchable thirst. The urine had been concentrated. And then the mother started noticing um, that the child had more like a sunken eye appearance. And there um, was starting to be changes in the child's urine output. And this was around the day of admission. So the child at that point became irritable, uh, still really like water hungry or eager to drink. And those were the vital signs that we discussed here uh, from the patient on admission. Um, the heart and lungs were clear on exam. The abdomen was a little bit tense, but um, more notable, the child didn't have a, maybe a reported history of any type of illnesses, but had syndromic appearing faces. The nasal bridge may have been a little bit more flat, and there were some noted epicanthial folds. The child did have a history of developmental delay and was kind of long for their age. At time of admission, the dehydration level was expected to be around 10%. So the child was, start, was starting on oral rehydration solution since they had difficulty getting an access, uh, getting, getting a cannula in. 
they received a rapid saline um, IV bolus pushes. And this was the amount of fluid given was about 30 mLs per kilo, which was about 500 mLs. They gave that bolus over, it looks like 45 minutes. So it sounds like child was admitted with those vital signs, they received oral hydration solution. And then once they were able to get a cannula in, the child did get a 30 mL per kilo fluid bolus over 45 minutes. At that point, they were able to get a second cannula and they were able to get labs at that point. There was a noted metabolic alkalosis. Um, there was some mild hyponatremia with a sodium of 132, potassium mildly low, hypokalemic 3.3, and mild hypochloremia, the chloride was 98. The CBC at that time showed a normal hemoglobin of 13, no, leukos no leukocytosis, um, and the platelets were 152. The child had a normal urine, a dungue, which was negative, and they had blood and urine cultures that were pendant. Okay, so on reassessment after the fluids, the heart rate had responded, we went from a heart rate of 174 to a heart rate of 123. Blood pressure had a mild improvement. We went from in the 60s to 76 over 40. And um, they made a comment that this was on a monitor. So um, I guess they didn't do manual. Uh, respiratory rate was 24. And then the child was 94% on room air. So the child was started on cephotax at 50 per kilo every eight hours. And then they received a 70 mL per kilo normal saline infusion given over four hours. And the plan was to transfer the child to a higher level of acuity. However, unfortunately, after a day on this therapy of cephotax and a, receiving a total of what looks like 70 mL per kilo over 40 hours, the child had a massive epistasis and passed a, a blood in the stool for the first time. The CBC showed an anemia, the hemoglobin was now five, the white count uh, had elevated, the, the child now had a leukocytosis with an 88% neutrophil predominance and extremely low platelets, platelets were 23,000. The child seized and had a massive intracranial hemorrhage on CT, and then the child passed away after the seizure. So with this type of case presentation, many things run through my mind as far as where to go. But again, I will say hindsight is 2020, and we're looking at this case after everything had already passed. But the question posed by the attendee was, if you received this patient, how will you have managed this patient and prevented the complications? Did the fluid management play a role in the development of DIC? So how it looks to me how the progression of this illness went, that this child potentially was uh, suffering from maybe like hypovolemic shock initially. Uh, the providers astutely recognized that the level of dehydration was significant and it was greater than 10%. So for me, if I see a child with like greater than 10% uh, dehydration, this is somebody who I would have started on IV therapy, which I think they tried to attempt, but unfortunately they weren't able to get access. So they did try to orally hydrate until they were able to get assessment, uh, to get an assessment with a cannula and, and get their labs. One thing I think was unfortunate is that the child received like a 20 or a 30 ml per kilo fluid bolus over 45 minutes. And as you guys know from what we reviewed earlier with the surviving sepsis campaign, recognizing signs of sepsis and shock as soon as possible is really important. And then when you need to fluid resuscitate to get those fluids in in a more timely manner. So I do think that maybe more fluids up front may have made a difference and it maybe have affected the pressures that this child had in the beginning, uh, maybe a little bit sooner than with them just receiving the a little over 20 ml fluid bolus in an hour. It looks like they were further behind that and they needed more fluids. 
they were able to get the second cannula in, which was great, but even the additional fluid boluses were given over several hours rather than given more front more quickly. Because if they were able to see if they, the child still wasn't improving, maybe they were looking at a fluid refractory shock type picture, maybe start impressors may have helped, I'm not sure. I'm very thankful that they were started on antibiotics but it's in the beginning of the presentation, we see this all the time, right? Like a viral gastroenteritis. Was it an, uh, a distributive shock related to like a bacteremia? It's hard to say, but they did start the child on cephalotax um, every eight hours for coverage, but were we covering the right thing or not? And someone who was more ill appearing, should we have considered broadening at that point? Now, with progression of disease, and maybe this child didn't present, unfortunately, until day five of illness and that far along on what was the trigger that made them then go into DIC, I'm not sure, and that's unclear, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a um, the, the sequelae that's related to uh, having a progressive shock type period, uh, shock type presentation is not uncommon that they would suffer from a type of brain image hemorrhage that happen, or sometimes we see instead of a hemorrhage or thrombus that may occur in DIC, or maybe this child um, became meningitic and seized. The sequelae of what happened in the order may not have been clear, um, but once this happens, is it a way to stop it? And I'm not sure about that. I think that the recognition of shock early on and sepsis early on was key and maybe starting fluids more and giving the fluids in the larger dose and more front may have been helpful because it didn't appear that this child had like a cardiac cause or cardiopulmonary cause that would um, warrant maybe a slower giving of fluids like 10 per kilo at a time with frequent reassessments to make sure that that was a reason to hold. Um, that would be my suggestion on how I would have managed this patient differently. They knew that they needed higher level of care and maybe those things weren't possible at the facility that they initially presented to and tried to transfer. But this was an unfortunate case where the child probably presented sicker than what was expected and didn't get the additional support. But thank you so much for sharing this case with us. And I think it's just another example of the early recognition of sepsis and shock is really important and starting your empiric antibiotics. Dr. Smith, uh, thank you so much for going through the cases. I know you had a third one, but we just keep getting so many great questions. Okay. I've got the last three minutes. Okay, let's do it. a few minutes, and maybe we can um, go through a couple of them. Um, uh, one that came in um, earlier was um, in related to a three-year-old who was um, struck with a metal object, looks like it was um, a metal pole of an umbrella during a windstorm. Child was fine, no loss of consciousness, no observable, no observable neurological deficits. But the question was, uh, and I know that you're in emergency medicine, this is more of the long-term, is there any recommendations for imaging later on as a child gets older just to make sure things are okay? Oh, so like imaging uh, X amount of time after this happens, child had no LOC, normal GCS, and no like hematomas, no step off, something like that. Did have a frontal hematoma. Okay. And how old was the child again? Three. Three. Yeah, you know, that can be a little hard. I wouldn't do any, it doesn't sound like any emergent imaging at that time. With the frontal hematoma in this age range, again, going back to our PCAR criteria, because the big thing that we're worried about is for TBIs, right? We were worried that there is a bleed that we have missed. We are worried that there is an epidural hematoma and that this child is going to decompensate later. And that kind of triggers us to go down the line of getting uh, head imaging. Uh, I don't think that this needs to be monitored for like prolonged periods of time. It's not our usual practice to then get a CT or MRI two, three, four days later, a week later, a month later. Now, if the child had some concussive like symptoms, which it doesn't sound like they did um, and didn't have any loss of consciousness, sometimes when you're going to uh, like thorough like concussion management, they like to have MRIs to assess. Um, any type of injuries that may have happened at some point. But again, I don't think that this is the case and that it would warrant further imaging to like throw it off or to be aware of kind of like things that may happen um, later down the road in the future. Not with a frontal hematoma only. 
Great, thank you. Um, and then there have a, a couple of questions that are kind of related to uh, fluid management. So I'm gonna ask you this one. I think that might be our last one, but um, question about um, commenting on lactated ringers versus saline, I guess I assume normal saline and dehydration and shock. And then I think with that, um, does permissive hypotension theory apply for pediatric resuscitation? Okay, so let's see, I have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> One minute. LR hot tops, and that is such a good question. LR versus normal saline. So, PALS hasn't changed with the resuscitation recommendations of resuscitating with normal saline. There have been many studies, especially in our adult counterparts, on whether you should resuscitate with balanced fluids like LR versus normal saline. But I don't think it's still been a ton of research still in children that would make me change from bolusin with lactated ringers quite yet. Now, there have been studies in trauma patients, and I feel totally comfortable being a pediatrician and PIM that I would be able to resuscitate people in traumas with those balanced fluids based on evidence. I would do that, but as far as like shock presentations related to hypovolemic shock related to like losses, I still am on the, I'm very guarded with using LR. And then the other thing to make sure that you remember too is that this hasn't been proven in like our neonatal population. I want to think about being very careful with bolus and with lactated ringers and those children who suffer from like neuromuscular disorders or any type of disorder where they're having any type of underlying electrolyte problems with bolus and with LR, um, just as a precaution, some children aren't able to um, uh, excrete or uh, the, the additional um, electrolytes that are in or the lactate, sorry, that's in LR. So those reasons alone, I still tend to be able to uh, move, lean towards resuscitating with normal saline versus LR. And I know we're at 1.30, but the permissive hypotensive, we're gonna have to do part two next time to go. I want you to make sure you get to your next um, uh, sessions, but thank you so much for those questions. And maybe they will be able to respond via email with that attendee, we'll uh, put that in. But thank you guys for all the interesting commentary, your questions, the cases, and I hope that this was really helpful and you guys making some decisions about pediatric urgencies and those emergencies. Yes, thank you for uh, that wonderful talk, Dr. Smith. Lots of really great information. Thank you everyone who joined the session. Really appreciate your, your attention. And as a reminder, tomorrow is the last day of our children's week. We are wrapping up with the sessions on return to play and common reasons for acute pain consultation. So thank you again for your attention and have a great afternoon.